Publishing. What do you say, Mike? Good morning. I'm in uh, Las Vegas. It's uh, going to be about 70 today. This is my favorite time of year in Vegas. The weather is gorgeous. Too yeah, you yeah. Come visit. Yeah, yeah. I, can't, I, I had I had tickets. I had to change them. I had tickets for. Oh, that's right. right. You were. I was going to be there tomorrow. I think. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. For uh, to to take do the final walkthrough and sign the contract for 2021 2022 which we aren't telling people where we're going yet i uh, i will go there as soon as i possibly can uh, hopefully june ish or something like that and come down and, and do the walkthrough do the meet and greet press the flesh except uh, virtually uh, and then uh, uh, hopefully sign that contract so we're on the strip with uh, 20 books vegas for 2021 and 2022 I bet you can cut a smoking deal right now. I, yeah, I, I, they gave us a, a great offer, like half of what everybody else offered. I'm thinking we might be able to improve on that. You know, I was on a, a, a conference call late last week um, with an economist from UNLV and a bunch of gaming executives. And what they're, are you locked up, Craig? But anyway, what these uh, what this economist is pro projecting or predicting is that uh, the script will be down until July, but uh, the local casinos like Sam's Down will open back up in June. Okay, it's me. I'm back. <laughs> I was just talking away. Oh, that's okay. Uh, the The thing with Be Live is even if I lose my feed, you're still live and the Facebook audience should be able to still hear you. So, okay. yeah, people, I just freeze and then go blank for a bit. And then uh, when I come back, I'm here and hopefully uh, everybody's volume is still good. And anyway, so. But anyway, they're, they're projecting that the strip will be closed down until uh, end of July. But the local casinos like Samstown will open up in early June. In early June, June to July, huh? Holy cow! Well, you I'm know, the the you know we're we're driven by tours and and conventions, and the conventions have all canceled up um, up to the first part of August. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. How, what, how's your schedule changed so far this year? The uh, I, I was going to like three different shows, and I'm I, I canceled all of that. So. Uh, I think we're still good for for Vegas in November. I I I, I, I have I have the utmost confidence that uh, Vegas will do what they need to do over these three months to make sure that everybody who goes there is safe, taken care of, even if they have to start stockpiling gloves and masks and whatever they need to do and 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 alcohol. Not like Vegas ever was hurting for alcohol, but uh, <laughs> but but they'll they'll make it work. They will make sure that it works. The uh, I was scheduled to speak at uh, Book Expo this year. That's gone. No, oh, yeah, go Javits. <laughs> um, and then uh, Western Riders uh, is normally in June. They postpone that till uh, Labor Day weekend. Okay. Um, those were, you know, those are my. Or well, Western Riders is is my favorite conference, but yeah. And I normally go to six or eight a year, and it'd be nice to just go to a couple this year. Yeah, yeah, and that's uh, – I know some people went to the self-publishing show in uh, London, but that was right at the beginning. It was right on the edge of being able to have that show and, and do it. I, I'm glad I didn't go because I would have been right. I would have been trapped or, or hassled in getting back uh, like my wife was coming back from Spain right at that time. She, she left Spain a day after Europe closed. So uh, she was one of the last flights out. Wow. Yeah. So but here we numbers? are. We're, we're, uh, we're looking good. Uh, published Nightwalker with Frank Roderus. That was a uh, Mike Bray introduction. Uh, we published Nightwalker 7 and Nightwalker 8 already on the, on the, the docket for uh, two books from now. And then we'll finish that series and keep Frank Roderus uh, relevant and hopefully uh, where visible on Amazon so people can see him and then go buy his other stuff for his estate because Frank passed away in 2015. So let's talk about how you got started in publishing. Okay. Um, 
I had a, a marketing agency here in Las Vegas. Uh, in, in 2009, an old friend, uh, L.J. Martin, approached me, asked me if I could sell books. Uh, this is Kindle came out in, in 2007, I believe. It was still yeah. brand new. I had one. I had a Kindle um, sitting in the drawer. I didn't never used it. My kids know I like gadgets, so as soon as it came out, they bought one. I don't think I put a book on it until about 2011. <laughs> but you had the tool. Hey, Mike, but I was you, selling the hell out of them. Can, um, but anyway, can you, can you move ahead. a little bit, a little bit uh, the other way? There you go. There you go. So, so you're in the, there you are. Perfect. Thanks, man. Anyway, I was approached by LJ Martin and his wife, Kat Martin. Um, <clears throat> LJ was a midless Western writer, still is, um, still writing. Kat right. Martin is, was just starting to hit the New York Times bestsellers list. Uh, she's yep. got, 24 New York Times bestsellers now. Yeah, Cat's an all-star. And so is Larry. Yeah, um, yeah, Larry's, uh, he's one of my favorite authors. And, it, and again, we're, we've are we been friends for 30, 35 years. But anyway, it turned out to be easy to sell books in 2009. There was no competition. Um, we had uh, Martin up, we ran him up to number seven in the action adventure authors with Westerns, uh, we were, by 2013, um, we were each making 20,000 a month off of his backlist, 45 books, just splitting it 50-50. And then he approached me with the publishing idea. I wasn't very high on it, um, but again, we were good friends and I didn't want him to go on his own and, and fail, so I joined him. And we hit the ground running. Our first, uh, we started with 45 books. Our, our second author was a gentleman by the, the name of Chet Cunningham. He brought 100 titles to us. Oh, geez. And then Westerns? Westerns, all Westerns. Um, okay. And then behind him was Frank Roders. Uh, Frank had, has, uh, I believe, four Spur Awards. Okay, the, yeah. The Spur Award is that's the that's the big award from the Western Writers of America. Uh, Wolfpack has a couple of them now. Good. Anyway, uh, we we ramped up by the by our fourth year. We we're hitting two million um, a year in income, in gross income. Uh, we'll do about three this year. Uh, the, sadly, um, I feel kind of guilty, but this virus has been very good for us. Uh, our numbers, our <clears throat> sales have jumped 32%. Uh, oh, geez. Yeah, since Saint, or since, uh, well, and then the last three weeks we've jumped 32%. Okay. Is, what do you chalk that up to? It's the all reads. Um, we, we put out a lot of box sets. When this thing first started heating up well yeah. about eight months ago we started throwing out box sets yeah but uh we're pushing them out faster than we have ever done before mike mike is a lover not a fighter he has a cat <laughs> and so uh yes yes they're uh, <laughs> I, I don't even know what to say lobo is, is uh the cat's name <laughs> anyway um Western Writers has won the uh, Lariat Award this year from Western Writers of America, um, or Wolfpack S, which is their big award that goes out to publishers. So we're we're getting some recognition. Uh, yeah, we've uh, got a featured article on the company coming out in Publishers Weekly in a few weeks, unless better news takes the takes place. Yeah, yeah. I don't think there's anything better than Wolfpack doing well. I, I, I think I, I think your uh, your increase might be due to the target demographic, not that, necessarily being able to get outside. Well, and and uh, Andrew Lee and I have talked about that a lot. Uh, we do have a, a, a older demographic than than LMBPN does. Uh, yeah, and they're reading and they're 
we were we're hitting a million and a half patriots a day um before all this started now we're we're bumping up against two million a day yeah and i i think that goes to uh the older readers who are stuck inside guys who are active and, and are used to being outside and doing something and now they can't you know uh and also i'm, I'm taking advantage of uh of the um, traditional publishers being hung up right now uh, yeah. in the last month we've signed harold robbins well his, his dead is good friday but we signed his uh his widow um, yeah. uh, max ellens collins is coming on board uh, uh let's see who else some names i can't mention yet yeah. but uh, these are all big new york times yeah. best-selling authors and so you're picking a, up exclusive publishing rights for new editions right we're doing their their backlist uh wolfpack started primarily as a backlist author um, yeah. our publisher and that's how we blew up so fast the guys like rotaris bring in 45 books at a time um yeah you know, they're bringing their their lifetimes work to us um yeah it's, and, and we take it pretty serious uh we we limit the number of authors we don't just throw this crap up if we if we can't sell it we'll, we won't take it and yeah. we won't take a single title from an author um we want to we want to uh, market the brand and, and not a title it's way more cost effective for us yeah and that's you you, you license you license uh, the products right we do Okay. Do you, have you ever bought IP? We have. Um, and I'm in negotiations with an estate right now to just buy them out. Just because okay. it looks like it's going to be a pain in the tail. Um, we have done some ghost written stuff. Uh, damn, that's profitable. <laughs> <laughs> if it's good. But you, you established a reputation as, as publishing good Westerns. Yeah. And, and we... <clears throat> The uh, the ghostwriters that are working for us, they're the same ones that are ghostwriting for Kensington and, and Signet, and, and they've been doing it for 100 years. Yeah. Well, you said Frank was, Frank brought 45 of his own titles, but he had written many, many more titles. Yeah, 300. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And for some big name authors. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the biggest name. In, in Westerns right now is, uh, you'll see him in, in uh, I'm not going to say his name, but if you go into Walmart, there's one Western author in there. Yeah. Um, he's been dead for 10, 15 years. Kensington was smart enough to keep that, build that brand up. The guy is way more successful since he died than he ever had, ever was alive. But there's three or four ghostwriters behind him. Okay. And, and three of them work for us. Nice, uh, nice. Publishing under their own name. Good. These, these guys that have spent their career as ghostwriters, and I'm talking about uh, like Robert Vaughn, um, uh, James Reisner. Yeah. Uh, big names had have had very successful careers, and they're getting to the end of them, and they're starting to regret that they spent their time as ghostwriters. They're not leaving the legacy behind, and um, but but you're giving them that option now, even later in life, yeah. and these are royalties that will go. This is their legacy that truly will get passed to their uh, heirs. Right, and and we have uh, we've signed authors just because of that. Good, good, I, and that's a uh, that's the philanthropy side. Yes, you need to make money to stay in business to woo estates like uh, Harold Robbins, but. You can still do good things for people, and that's uh, I, James Reasoner. He actually applied, and uh, and uh, I, I put him into uh, the Independent Alliance of Sci-Fi Authors, a group that I started for uh, professionalizing uh, science fiction and fantasy authors, uh, creating a, a professional group for those folks. But James, I saw him, and I'm like, all these westerns, and but then there were a couple sci-fi titles in there, and thought that was cool. James and and Libya Reasoner are great people. Um, you will, it'd be hard to find anybody that knows more about the publishing industry than Reasoner. The guy, he's read thousands and thousands of books and he can tell you the plot line from a book he read in high school. 
<laughs> Unbelievable. That's great. Yeah, yeah, that is cool. I'll have to send him a note and uh, and, and and introduce myself because he sounds yeah, like a it. sounds like a cool star. Uh, uh, Olivia Reasoner's got a little press. Um, she does uh, Western romance, and it's called Prairie Rose. And they've got two or three hundred titles up. Oh, okay, okay. And that's when because uh, <clears throat> you're you're an indie publisher, you don't write, but you help facilitate these. What kind of when you first started out, what kind of bankroll did you need in order to get off the ground? You know, we uh, pretty much did this all out of pocket. Um, I had an existing company. I had I was spending ten to twelve hours a day playing poker. To be perfectly honest, yeah. Uh, I had a company that was just running itself. Uh, so money wasn't an issue when we started. And again, when I started, it was just LJ and Kevin. little competition, and there was okay. absolutely no competition. Okay. I remember when the announcement came out. I don't remember what year, but uh, when uh, Amazon announced that they had two million titles, I were calling up Larry and saying, "You know what? This is getting crowded. Maybe we should start thinking about an exit." And now we're at eight million titles, and and adding titles to it. Yep. Yep. Well, that's that's once you build your market share, even though on paper it may look like you're you're reducing your market share, you're not because your share of the readers only continues to grow as a as a raw number. It does. The but the uh, the public and that's one of the things I know Michael uh, and I have talked about that on the on the CNM show is how do you uh, how, how do you bankroll when you first start and it does take a lot of money, especially because if you're a hundred titles. If you're going to put new covers on those, now you have all those costs, whether in time or money. You have all of the uh, let's get them up, let's do an ad, let's maintain our newsletter. Let's you have employees, you don't have subcontractors, so you have all of those costs as well before that title hits the street. Which then, two months down the road, you'll start seeing revenue from it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, uh, you're, you're right. Um, again, we lucked out early. We got in way early. Um, we were Larry Martin, LJ Martin did all of our covers to begin with. Um, he did uh, four or 500 covers. Uh, some of them looked very amateurish. Yeah. Uh, those covers would not work in today's market, but then they did fine again. And we had no competition. Yeah. Um, because, because the selling point on that cover was LJ Martin, the, the image was almost irrelevant. Yeah, as long as we had a gun and a, or a horse, something to identify it as a western. We're, yes, we're yep. golden. Yep, yep. I see the uh, uh, the playbill font is big nowadays on the the big selling new releases from uh, from western authors like John Stone. I see his huge uh, uh, Ken Farmer as well on his stuff with that the, the playbill kind of uh, font. Mm -hmm. I, I find that hard to read in thumbnail, but it's still on Westerns. That's the font you have to use. It, uh, I've got the worst eye in the world. So I, I try to stay away from covers. But your, but your, a uh, couple of your, your employees do have great eyes to see yeah. what we've got. Uh, and we've got a great cover artist on, on our painted covers. We use, uh, Tony Macero, um, out of okay. England, uh, and and those painted his painted covers are awesome. Yeah, well, and the benefit of a painted cover is if you ever want to do merchandise, you own the whole the whole image. <clears throat> you don't have well, you need an extended license on these three different pieces of stock art at uh, at a cost of ninety dollars each or whatever it might be. <clears throat> I need to find where are you getting your stock art. <laughs> Oh, the, I, just the cover artists. I, uh, I have so many uh, cover artists. Ryan Schwartz uh, has done uh, a number of titles for me. Uh, uh, Heather Center has done covers for me. I've got them from Tom Edwards, a science fiction, but he paints them, so that's completely. But most science fiction titles have some kind of stock art in there. And then you just, if you're going to put it on merchandise, you got to put that, uh, you got to get that extended license for the various pieces in there. I think deposit photo has been very uh, lucrative for us. Uh, 
the, the regular places for stock art that, that we go, but you just have to be aware of what you're putting into your covers. Yeah. Again, uh, Westerns is such a small genre. Um, you know, there's, there's not the stock art are out there available. Um, again, we've got, we've got close to 1400 titles. So we, okay. we know that stock art, um, like the back <clears throat> of our hand. Um, that's right. That's right. We're we're uh, using the same images and changing the clothes and putting beards on them. Changing sure, the guns. sure. As long as you get, as long as you have a gun and a horse and that right, uh, the right font and uh, and color palette. Mm -hmm. but the uh, for uh, use contracts for all your authors. Did you did you develop those yourselves? We did well. We had an attorney do it, but yes. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah. And that's I always try to reinforce. As a lawyer, I always try to reinforce. Use a contract. There's plenty out there in my uh, <clears throat> in my book collaborations. I have some sample contracts that you can use for uh, to see what language is there. But if you're gonna if you're gonna start a business, a publishing business, you need to get you a lawyer and do it right, tailored to your specific business and what your goals are. Oh, absolutely. Um, I've, I've learned that lesson in other industries. Yeah, yeah. But the uh, right, where do you see where do you see the market going right now? I think this is a golden opportunity for the for indies. Um, the traditional publishing is a mess. Uh, there hasn't been any paper shipped in from China in over three months now. Uh, uh, even I got an email from Ingram yesterday. They're cutting down. Um, okay. Yeah. And that's not the, uh, it's not because they're non-essential. Um, they can get by with it, but they're worried about inventory. Okay. Uh, they're not getting the paper, so they want to limit what they print. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Publishers Weekly is scrambling, looking for plan B, plan C type um, printers. And they've been in uh, business for Hundred years. Hundred years. Yeah, yeah. Holy cow. That's a. Uh, but so so paper clearly. You know, a number of Barnes and Noble are closed. Uh, I think eventually uh, all of them will close. Will all of them open back up? Always a big question. I I think they will open back up, but with a smaller footprint. Um, I, I I always thought that Barnes and Noble was just a real estate play. So. Um, Indiegogo um, announced last night they're bringing back 450 employees. Oh, good. Out of 4,500. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, 10%, but that's just to get the money out of Canada. Um, uh, the U.S. is is uh, with their PPP program. Any employer that they, they see it as everybody took a hit with this deal. Yeah, our um, Wolfpack's profit is just skyrocketing right now, and we're eligible for um, a six-figure check from them. Okay, and, okay, and we're going to take the money. Well, as long as you well, keep them employed, it's it's not, you don't have to pay it back. Correct, and it, even if I did, if I took it and, and went and, and bought a new house, um, I don't have to pay one percent. Okay, so yeah. anyway. Uh, Canada has a similar um, program, although you have to prove that you've taken a hit. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and you have to bring employees back. And that's what Indiegogo is doing. Or, or okay. Indigo is doing. Okay, okay. Um, <clears throat> Good. I, I see I see paper. And this is where why indies, I think, are, are taking less of a hit now than other authors. Some indies who specifically publish in paper like uh, Joseph Alexander, he, he publishes uh, a guitar self-help books and his print books are his main, like 90% of his sales. And he's taken, a, he's seen a big drop off. But if you publish eBooks right now, people are in Amazon US and Amazon UK are both offering a free 30, uh, free two month subscription for new subscribers. So, hey, I, I published that along with, oh, here's my new release. If you're in U.S. or U.K., get KU and read this truly for free. That's uh, that's the first time I've ever seen them give a 60-day free look. Um, but then 
I don't know if they're following the, the streaming services. Netflix is doing the same thing. Yeah, it yeah. works. Well, and also it gives that impression, hey, we're a big corporation, we make a lot of money, and we're giving back. And Amazon, Amazon will prime the pump. I'm afraid tomorrow we'll see what the uh, uh, KU rate payout rate was for for March. I, I think it'll drop. I think it has to drop. But Amazon will prime that pump like they do every that that fund that's in there that you get paid for the page rate is kind of disassociated from the number of page reads. So this is something that people need to understand that Amazon puts into that pot not what they make from the $10 a month subscription, but what they need to, to pay the authors enough to keep authors on board with the program. And that's, it's, they might make more than they, uh, I think they keep, I think they put more money in there than they necessarily make from the program. I gotta believe it's profitable for them. Um, <clears throat> you know, and I've, I've never asked them. I. I don't know if they tell me if it was or not, but yeah, I I, I have had conversations, and I'm I, I I'm still left uh, not completely confirmed that they don't just uh, add some money in there, that they take whatever they get from the ten dollars subs and put it in there because every time they can get a reader, because through KU, here you are, you are linked to Amazon every time, and even if you buy just a Kindle reader, which those are mostly for cost you're still buying the books or, or you're, you're reading the books and you're exposed to more, more ads on, on, on uh, Amazon. Amazon's biggest profit center this year is going to be their ads and not their AWS, their Amazon servers that everybody, that 30% of the U.S. has space on. Is that something? It, uh, so that, know, that's it. I'm sorry. Go ahead. That's the trend. Um, you know, that's what Facebook bought uh, Instagram. They ran out of room to advertise on. They just bought it for another advertising platform. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's true. Um, the uh, back on the KU deal. That's um, eighty percent of our income is off of those pages, Red. Um, and we're. We're in bookstores and we're in libraries and, and that end of the industry, it damn sure sucks. Okay. And it's gonna suck for a long time. <clears throat> Although okay. the libraries are, they're flush. They're, they're sitting on all this cash, you know, they're government supported, so. Yeah. Uh, well, nobody's going in anymore. I mean, I think most libraries closed. Yeah, no, they are, uh, they're all closed. Okay. I feel sorry for the, uh, for my friends and that are, uh, releasing books right now and from traditional publishers. That's a mess. I, I, I think what I what I heard from uh, the big five was like right now, everything that was being looked at for a, a, a royalty advance has been canceled completely because they can't guarantee when they'll be able to print the book. They can't guarantee when they'll be able to get them in bookstores because usually you get those twice a year where trad gets with Barnes and Noble and the, and the, and books a million and says, here, we want to reserve book space for this title. And it's all about shelf space that they have to reserve and get a, get a commitment to. And without that, I mean, they can't give an advance cause they have no idea what they're going to make on a book. No, they, uh, I know a lot of the bigger titles they push forward, um, that we schedule for release right now. Uh, nobody knows how to play this thing. No, no, it's unprecedented. But like you said, you're up 32% because there are venues for people to read Wolfpack publishing titles from home. And you have 1,400. So your number, it's not like, I see a lot of people saying, oh my God, my page reads have dropped. This is, well, you know, when was your last new release? When was, uh, what kind of advertising are you doing? How big is your list? How are you, uh, uh, engaging with your readership. What are those things you're doing? Cause I'm, I, I think I finally dropped about 10%, but I'm in between new releases and I released in three different genres. My last one was Frank with the one with Frank Roderick's book seven in the Nightwalker series. And then I'll release a book next week for that. It, that is in my main headliner series and that should rocket, uh, rocket the revenue for the last of the month and then into May. But uh, it's, 
it's the engagement and the ability to work with the readers and in bigger numbers. If you, if you don't have a lot of books, you're going to see really wild variations right now. But over a lot of books, the trend is going to be positive for eBooks and especially Kindle Unlimited. For those people who are wide, somebody commented about wide. Let me copy that over. Um, the, uh, the, the, uh, a challenge with wide is how are, how is Amazon or Apple, how is Kobo, how are BNN reaching out to readers and making it easy for them to pick up your book? Amazon, by making KU free, they've made it easy for readers to pick up books and spend zero money for the next two months. Oh, and that's the, the shopping experience. Yeah. Have you ever tried to buy a book from Apple? What a pain in the ass. Um, you know, I, and I'm prejudiced. I got, I've been in this again, you know, since almost the beginning. Yeah. And I've met with Barnes and Noble and I've met with Apple and, uh, and, and I, um, put hundreds of books on those platforms could not sell them. Yeah. And it's, it's cause their, their bestsellers list is curated. Um, there's some human making that decision. And with Barnes and Noble, um, it may cha may have changed now with new ownership, but that was that was decided with money. <laughs> so yeah, the yeah. big five got they got the uh, the shelf space on on their their on the internet, and I, I didn't qualify, so I I kind of worked against them. Yeah, yeah. Amazon, Amazon embraced us. <clears throat> Why not? Amazon rewards books that sell. Because you'll see, you'll see big, big five published uh, authors there and killing it, and then you'll see some big five names, and you look at them and it's like this. This book has fifteen reviews, and it's ranked thirty five thousand. Th this is a big name, yeah, but that book didn't sell, and the readers, and then Amazon said, "I, I don't care who you are. If you're not selling, we're going to move you down in the list from people who are selling," and that's what gets the support. Oh, that's uh, you know, on the keyword end of it. Uh the uh, you see these authors that stuff the keywords. They don't realize that uh, the conversions is even a more important factor. Um, yeah. They may get it up there for a day, but somebody clicks on that and doesn't buy. Amazon will knock it down just as fast as it climbed up. Yep, yep. So so what what do you do for your authors to make to improve the rates of uh, the conversion? We we spend a lot of time on the descriptions. Uh, again, I've I've got people with better eyes picking the covers than I do. Yeah. Um, and we advertise heavy. Um, we we spend about a thousand dollars a day on ads. Okay. Okay. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm I'm spending uh, not not near that, but uh, I'm still spending uh, pretty big for me this month. I'm probably going to hit, geez, uh, six thousand maybe this month on uh, on ads. We we leaned, leaned into it. We cranked our as soon as this uh, virus stuff started, we cranked up our ad spend. You know, and, and, it paying off, and the timing was just right. Kunt said had uh, you know he three months ago he signed with Thomas and Mercer. Yep. Um, last week he hit uh, uh, Publishers Weekly's uh, top twenty hardbacks from Thomas and Mercer. I don't think that's yep. ever been done before. No, no, because because uh, usually they get stonewalled by New York Times and, and USA Today because uh, and and Amazon won't have anything to do with those platforms. They're like, hey, this is our guy. We're we're going to make him number one in overall number of sales. But your MPD book scan, we don't care. Yeah. All of a sudden, right after that, I get a Thomas and Mercer phone call or a, a author from Thomas and Mer Mercer calls me and can we talk? So we're getting them, you know, since Coons kind of paved the way a little bit, more of these trad authors are, are looking at the alternative. Uh, the people we deal with are a little older. They're not going to learn a, the self-publishing uh, route. Yeah. They're more comfortable with the publisher, but they're looking at the smaller presses. Yeah. Like, like Wolfpack, you're indie. It's you. But you developed a, a, a Wolfpack is a, a formal corporation. It's a real business. So, but you're not you're not trad. You don't go after shelf space in stores. You go after it's it's 
you're an indie publisher mainly for people in indies who who uh, uh, aren't going to go that route because like you said older demographic I've worked with a couple of uh, of your authors and yeah they just they're they're tech savvy and stuff they just want to tell a great story and they're willing to go on the road because the old style and this is something you told me and I'm like that's bullshit that, that that's not real that these people make money from selling books out of the trunk of their car on the road. And I talked to some of them. They're like, but what's our plan for? And I'm like, holy shit. No, you're not, you don't have to go on the road. Just write a book. Stay home. <laughs> you know, go outside and cut your grass. But don't, yeah, you don't put books in the trunk of your car and drive around. Oh, my God. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of organizations still teaching that model. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We are, we are distributed by Ingram. Um, we are in, in bookstores. Okay. We are in libraries, but I don't okay. push that end of it. It's the digital end is so much more profitable and, and less risk. Um, it's, it's, it's lower overhead. So yeah, yeah there's, you know, there's no, no chance of returns. After the uh, uh, Barnes and Noble sold, um, they, they clean shelves. I got literally boxes of returns, 700 books piled up on my doorstep. Yep, I, I have uh, I have one series with uh, with the Simon and Schuster imprint, and uh, I was appalled because they they sold all these copies. I'm looking at the numbers. I'm like, wow, this is so cool, and I, we sold like a thousand, fifteen hundred copies to Barnes and Noble, and and three months later, no shit, here comes seven hundred of them back, and I'm like, you got to be kidding me, because I'm like, hey, look at the oh, look at the lack of money, and uh, and, and and there's nothing you can do about it. Because those are three, those are seven hundred paperbacks that went into limbo. Now I contact, hey, can I get some of these? And it's, it's they just get destroyed. You really don't have, uh, in in many cases, you can't get them. Because I would have bought them all. I can sell them up here for Pete's sake. Uh, End times Alaska sells in Alaska, written by an Alaskan for Alaskans. But the, the uh, still the shelf space, it's cool. But you you might get one digital return out of. 200 300 sold but and in paperbacks <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah you never feel the digital returns um no. we uh when i first started we used to tell them to carry the covers uh-huh but um and it, it our, our uh, paperback sales would be higher we would be moving more in bookstores if i didn't re um, require them to return the book <clears throat> okay, um, okay. I, but uh I had a, a conversation with the bookstore owner a couple of years ago, a big, this is a big store, a big, well-known. And the owner told me she had no problem tearing off covers um, when the bill was due, mailing them back and placing the same order. Does that make sense? It, it, she, it, from a business it, it, perspective, yes, I can see that, but it's unethical and unfair as hell. Yeah, that whole system is broken. It's, it's, I can see why it was created during the Depression. Okay. Um, but hell, how long ago was that? Um, well, the same system would be in place if we have another Depression. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, how long is that? Well, next month, maybe? I, I, I don't know. <laughs> the, uh, so, so what do we do as Indies? For me, I always encourage you to keep writing, establish a new routine because your old routine was upset and make sure you keep creating content and getting it out there. I published four books already this year and I'm, I was I was only going to publish four to six books this year that I personally wrote. I'll probably publish more like 10. And and so these are going to keep me in diamonds. They're, they're going to keep the revenue flowing as this goes on and as we re return to a new normal that there's still the content is out there. Reading is going to take precedent because the internet is bowing under the pressure of everybody trying to stream Netflix and Disney Plus and and, and CBS All Access. You can't get there from here because uh, I, I know people are jumping in and out here on our internet. And I did earlier because so many people are online. I, I do it at six in the morning just so I have some throughput. If I tried to do it at five in the evening, my time, our internet completely stops. I, I I turn off the computer at that point and uh, and go watch some TV because I can't I can't download even a, a 200 kilobyte file. I can't download because my internet's so slow at that point. Facebook has more traffic on it right now than it ever has in history. Um, I'm telling my authors don't get addicted to the damn platform. 
but spend more time on it. Um, yes, yes, and 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 advertising rates have dropped significantly on on Facebook because so many people are on it. And, and Amazon as well. Um, we uh, part of the reason our ad spend um, went up so much wasn't by design. It was because our competition backed off. Yep. Yeah, that came as a surprise <laughs> to me too. I. I, I, I I had to I had to shut off a couple ads. I found an ad for a book that wasn't published anymore that was starting to charge again. I'm like, holy shit, why is this still running? <laughs> so clicked it. Yeah, clicked it off real quick. I'm, I mean, when you have uh, 150, 200 ads that are live, uh, you know, I don't I don't check them as often as I should. But those they started selling. I'm seeing my uptick. And I'm like, this is way cool. So more bang for your buck, but you're going to spend. Amazon Amazon is spending more of my money. Uh, Facebook is spending. They always spent my money, but now I'm getting more impressions. So the blurb, you got to have that blurb. You got to have that catchy hook. You got, and we talked to Kate Pickford about that yesterday, about your first chapter, like a look inside. Uh, Neil Gaiman's Neverwhere is on sale right now for $2.99, and this is considered the author's preferred edition. And so I went in, I started reading it. I'm like, oh, okay, this isn't a book that I, I'm, I'm going to read, so I didn't buy it. But it's on sale and things like that's who you're competing with. Uh, the this stuff, everybody's throwing stuff up there because Big Five, their financial hit that they just took by not being able to publish paper, they're they're uh, they're getting those books. So BookBub features are going to be tougher to tougher to get. Amazon ad space will ramp back up. Take advantage right now because they're not there yet. They're just buying a BookBub feature and getting it in, but they're not advertising on Facebook or Amazon anywhere near as much as they will in a month or two. So get yourself established now and start making some money. Yeah. And it's establish your own network on Facebook. Um, you know, I tell my authors, don't count on me. Um, we do send out arcs and we, we yeah. try to hit the um, ground with, with reviews on each new release. But, uh, since Facebook is so busy right now, I'm telling my authors, create your own group, create your own launch team. There's a perfect platform for it. Take me out of that loop or, you know, accept some of that responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you've made it because you've, you assumed the role that they were used to a traditional publisher style role of they write the book, they give you the book, you make magic happen, and then you send them money. That uh, the old style, the prior to that was, and then the publisher sends that author on the road. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, and that's not cost effective no. for anybody. Which talking about that, uh, Lee Goldberg, <clears throat> initially, I thought he was coming to 20 Books of Vegas. That was my mistake. And that was then, my mistake. And I, and I talked with him. And he's like, oh, the reason I'm not is because I'm now with, I think Thomas and Mercer is who he's gone with. And mm -hmm. I'm going to be on the road for the next six months. That's when I just get off the road and I don't want to travel anymore. If all of that's canceled, I wonder if Lee Goldberg can come to 20 Books Vegas. So <laughs> I'll ask him. Because I, I mean, because he's now not on the road. And I saw that his latest, his last couple were like runaway. His, his last pre-order was a runaway number one on like all of Amazon. Mm -hmm. And he's, uh, he does extremely well on the paperback side. He's, he's got loyal followers. Um, yeah. And he's a hell of an author. Have you read him? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he writes a compelling story. Lee Goldberg is, is a, a thriller all-star that compelling story that once you start reading, you keep reading. I do have a couple of his titles. I accidentally bought the pre-order. I'm like, oh, let me check. Lee Goldberg, he's going to come. Let me, let me, let me check his title. And I click buy and then I let, fucking pre-order. God damn it. That was, I wanted to read his book now. You know, I, I just, uh, Lee's brother's name is Todd, I believe. He teaches uh, creative writing in, in one of the universities in California. But I just read one of his books and he's a hell of an author too. Good, good. And and Lee, how how did you how did you meet him? Lee has a little press, uh, and uh, we were talking about maybe a possible acquisition. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. But what you you also go to like BoucherCon, right? Yeah, we go to BoucherCon. Uh, 
We're at all the bigger conferences. Okay. Um, Thriller your, Fest your, is your, your favorite ones. Thriller Fest and VoucherCon. Okay. 20, 20 books. Um, Western Writers, I do most business. But, okay. uh, you know, we, we ran that Western genre about as hard as we can. Um, we've had as many as 80 of the top 100 titles. Jeez. Uh, yeah. So we're just, we're stepping on our, on our own toes. We're, we're taking money away from our authors and we push it that hard. Yeah. Cause you're, it's your readership. So if you, if you publish so many books to your readership, they then have to pick and choose what they want to read, which is it's keeping the overall Wolfpack revenue the same, but you're, you're dividing it up more ways. Hmm. What, um, what do you, what is, a, what is a publishing schedule when you acquire a backlist of like, hey, Frank, 45 books, great. How do you publish those? We, we try to, uh, when we have a big backlist or in one genre, our, our goal is to keep um, a couple titles and the hot new releases. That's like free advertising the way I see it. Okay. Um, so we we'll release on every... 30, oh, well, 29 days. Okay. Um, what we started doing, and this was one of Michael Anderley's brilliant ideas, um, is, is when we tie up these bigger authors as just going with omnibuses, we'll break those up sometime in the future. Yeah. Um, like, uh, Max okay. Allen, uh, Max Allen Collins is coming on board. Um, he's another Thomas Mercer author, uh, New York Times bestselling author, uh, sold multiple movies. Uh, Road to uh, Prevention was his. Okay. Anyway, he's coming on board and he's writing an original. And but his backlist he's bringing, we'll throw those out as omnibuses. Okay, and that and that way you can maintain one edition. Because 80% of your revenue from KU, you throw out a book that's 180,000 words, you make some decent money off that. You know, I, I just had that conversation with Cap Martin um, over the weekend. Uh, we're releasing a, a big omnibus for LJ Martin. Okay. Yeah, we pre and we're going to put it out at, at 99 cents or 2.99. And, and again, cats from the traditional world, that makes absolutely no sense. But a read through on that thing is 15 bucks. So yep. we'll yep. do okay. Yeah, yeah, that's, I've got, uh, I, I tried to go with 299 as a pricing as that, that, uh, 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 that uh, balance point between getting the page reads versus getting a sale, because 99 cents, my, my fans all bought it. And they're like, oh man, I'm not getting the page reads. And then I started advertising at 99 cents and people were borrowing it. So then the ads starting and the page read started to climb because mm -hmm. advertising, if, if they have KU, they, that's going to be their preferred method. They're reading, they have KU because they read a lot of books. And this is, so that's what makes this program so valuable is targeting the KU readers. Once you, once they come on as, as fans and super fans, then that's a different group of folks, but hitting them with the ads, they're, they're going to go for that Kate. They're going to go for that borrow and the read and my, my one nine book omnibus, which came out at 2964 for KENPC. So just under the 3000 limit that Amazon pays. And that has been my, my number one money earner for nine months straight now. Is that right? Yep. Yep. That's something that in the traditional world, one out of every couple thousand books, We'll have a life like that. Yeah, yeah. Now I advertise, but why not? Because I'm, I have, I look, I spend sixty dollars a day on it, <clears throat> on advertising for that book, and if I make sixty one, it's a good day. I have never fit in those nine months. I have never failed to have a positive number over top of my ad spend on that on that omnibus. So I'm, that's money in the bank because now after nine months. I keep rolling over the same money that I've been spending for nine months. So I'm not investing any new funds into that, uh, into that book. So it really takes the edge off of everything else 
when you have a positive ROI on your ad spend every single day. Oh, you bet. Um, and it's, uh, we've had them go, go against us too, though. It, uh, oh, really? <laughs> you kind of take your eye off the ball and whoops, it went four grand. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Or, uh, I got uh, in a bad deal last year and it was like 20 grand. So and yes, it yes. took a month to correct it. Ooh, ooh, <laughs> yeah, whoops. I'll yeah. show you that chart one of these days. Yeah, yeah, I, I look forward to that one. <laughs> but I, I have uh, I have a couple trips planned to Vegas between now and 20 books. So I have three trips to Vegas planned for this year. And they may actually be the only trips I take until December. And, and assuming the world is opened up at that time when I go down under to see my, my son and his family in, in Australia and go someplace warm over Christmas because it's too damn cold up here. But the the, uh, the trips of Vegas, we'll we'll get together when when uh, when I'm there. It's always yeah. a, always a pleasure. <laughs> it's always a good time. Yeah. <laughs> Damn. Yeah. We'll stay yeah, away man. from Area Fifty One. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. I didn't pay that ticket, so I mean, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> I still got a picture. So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, I made videos. We're 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 good. We're fun, uh, yeah. and and we definitely eat well. Probably too well. <laughs> Wait, that's uh, that's one thing about Vegas. It's not hard to find a good steakhouse. Yeah, and and since you started your journey, you've been publishing for ten years. You said you were playing poker ten hours a day. You were also very concerned because you said I got I got to I got to do something or I'm going to die. Uh, you've lost fifty pounds since then. Uh -oh. 70 70 nice well yeah. done well done um and i a lot of that is just working my ass off literally i mean that's i've been it's 12 14 hour days uh no i've had four real days off in 10 years well yeah. that's not true in six years since we we opened up wolf pack in june of 2013. okay I've had four days off in that period. Complete days off. Even when we went to Area 51, you were in the back. You were working almost the whole time while we were driving. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, and, I, I, and every time I see you, you're the same thing. I gotta get from my room <laughs> <laughs> and then bitching them out the layout. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I uh, well, and that's why I for the tax man, the IRS can hook electrodes to my nads and say tell me you were working on this trip I, and i'll tell them i work every single day no matter where i am so i'm writing off everywhere i go because i work every single day you know uh again cat martin and i go way back and one thing about her is she's a lot like you extremely disciplined and uh it doesn't matter what conference that she could be at thriller fest she still gets her four hours in before she talks to anybody. Um, you got to respect that. And that, that's what Nora Roberts said too. She said, I don't care. I am working. Here's my, I work from eight till noon. So if I'm at a conference, you will not see me before like one because mm -hmm. in the, she gets her four hours. She writes, she creates, and she's writing four books a year. And she says she spends probably half of her time thinking and planning before she's writing. So it's a you know good honor because she's done that consistently for 30, 30 years or more, and that's what it takes that consistency of uh, of publication. I know a lot of the stuff you pick up is from authors who are on the twilight of their career and may not be creating a lot of new content, but you add that old content. It's new content for your readers because if you bring in an author who's uh, who, who has fifty titles. Some of these, some of your readers may not have ever seen them before. So this is an important point to keep in mind as you're publishing and you're adding new titles, even if it's only two or four a year, every new reader you add to a new title, that could be a new reader back for your first book and your entire backlist. So when Wolfpack picks up, and I can't believe there's too many new readers of Westerns, but when Wolfpack picks up a new reader says, hey, these are good stories. If they go back into his catalog, Wolfpack, there anything you want. Here it is. Great stories. Come on, come aboard and enjoy yourself. You know what our number one comment is in our reviews? 
and this is dumping them all in, into a, a cloud. The number one comment is I haven't read a Western since I was a kid. Um, That's cool. Yeah, and we're we're bringing them back in that way. I I didn't read a Western until after I met you, Mike, because you, you made some yeah. recommendations. You're like, hey, here's the story. When you shared, I, it was it was one guy's son and a legacy. He's like, here's here's my handwritten notes. And you shared that with me. And I looked at it. I'm like, holy shit, this is great. How to write a great story, not just a great Western. So I started reading some Louis L'Amour and some Zane Gray. And I like I like Louis L'Amour, Louis L'Amour better than Zane Gray. And and you see the story. It's like these are gripping tales. They're well written. They're fast moving. It's like this is great. So actually, I read more Westerns now than anything else. I uh I'm reading more traditional stuff now. Again, uh, we we push the westerns as hard as we can. Yeah, uh, we're, we're expanding into other genres. Uh, <clears throat> we've been doing really well with men's adventure. Um, yeah, the old '70s '80s style Mac Bowen type. Um, yep. Well, and you bring Harold yeah. Robbins. That's your their perfect target for your readership. Uh, yeah, that was a that was a coup. We got 18 titles from the fifth the most profitable author in history. Oh uh, yeah. He's out earned everybody. That's a win. Big win. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and some of your some of your readers <clears throat> probably hadn't read him in years and will pick up a new copy to put on their Kindle. I've had um, two blogs so far that approached <laughs> me, asked for review copies, you know, and they've just heard the rumors. Nice. So. Nice. Wolfpack stepping it up. And 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 uh, Mike started with uh, L.J. Martin. They published a few titles and say, here's some backlist. They put them out there. They added authors. And this is how you do it as an indie publisher. Know your market first and foremost. And that was one thing that you did know when you started. You knew the marketing. Larry knew the, uh, the, the genre. And then you both got in there and made it work. Yeah. And, and uh, we had a, a hell of an advantage. Laurie Martin had been going to the Western Writers Conferences for 30 plus years. Yeah. Um, yeah and you know him. I mean, he's the guy's never met a stranger. Um, yeah, so it, we had no problem yeah. tying up authors. And back in the early days it, with these authors, it, it was like found money. Yeah. Holy hell. You mean I can get a, a, a check from this crap that I wrote 30 years ago? Yeah. And yeah, again, and yes. Westerns are a little different. That genre is timeless. Um, yes. A, a Western written today reads just like a Western written by Zane Gray in the 40s. Yeah, exactly. Because you're going back to the 1890s, <clears throat> and, and people have been writing Westerns far longer than the actual Western period existed. Mm -hmm. So, uh, <laughs> <it's>, uh, <laughs> it, yeah, it is. Yeah, it I is. Agree. But we have uh, Elena Johnson coming on. I think tomorrow, and she is Western Romance. She is one of the top authors in Western Romance. And I know you're you have been getting into Western, especially Christian Romance, as a, as one of your side gigs. We uh, yeah, we do extremely well with Christian uh, westerns, uh, and, and those are all women reading them. We did a deep dive into that, and that uh, to kind of figure out who they were, yeah. and, and they're not they're not buying them because of the Christian end. Um, they're buying them because they're clean. They, yeah. They know they're, there's not going to be a bedroom scene in them. Okay. Yep. Yep. Um, we, uh, we're looking for a, a big um, Western romance author. Um, we'll probably tie one up this year. Give Elena a little run. Okay. Okay. We've got, we've got a question on the screen there for you. I need to write a portal urban fantasy alt earth cowboy story. I don't know where to start. Any suggestions? Yeah. You know, there's a real soft genre called uh, Western sci fi, Western horror. I'm dominating that bitch. <laughs> Markel owns it. <laughs> <laughs> well, with, uh, with, with Frank Roderus. Yeah. So a sci fi author teams with a Western author and writes. This and uh, the Nightwalker series, no kidding, it's uh, Western sci fi. Yeah, you know, just um, change the, you know, change our horse out for uh, some 
a better vehicle. Yeah, a better vehicle. An apocalypse, man. Apocalypse. Yeah, yeah. Um, but so, so is that where? Uh, yeah. yeah, read my series. Urban away. fantasy. Yeah, and actually, that's that's not a bad suggestion, Craig. Um, those are short, quick, easy reads. Um, yeah. And and Rotors, Frank Rotors was one of the best. That and and I would always recommend just grab a Louis Lamour. You only have to read a few chapters. You can see the style. You can see the flow, uh, and you can see. And also, I hate to say it, but write compelling fiction. The book that uh, Larry wrote first, and I added all the sci-fi kind of angle and some indie stuff. That goes into a lot of how to approach writing westerns. Actually, that's a good suggestion too. Getting the terminology correct and. And how do you wicker a scene? What are the right words for, for Western approach? And he gives a lot of examples how to tighten it. So yeah, write compelling fiction, Louis L'Amour, and uh, and then and then my Nightwalker series. Uh, it uh, not not I mean not self promotion, but if you're trying to just get a flavor of what it's like, that uh, that gets it. Especially the first three books in the Nightwalker series, which Frank Roders wrote, those are the ones you get his full flavor in a different environment. The uh, the urban fantasy part is what threw me. I I'm yeah. trying trying to uh, picture a title that fits in there, and I can't think of one. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, yeah, you could say I watched Harry Potter on TV, and that's uh, that that that, that works. But thanks, Elaine. Uh, good question. We're gonna wrap it up. It's been sixty one minutes, and and Mike uh, has a lot to do because it's it's a day that ends in Y, so he's working. I really appreciate you coming on, Mike. Thanks, Greg. I appreciate it, too. Uh, your insight is great, and we look forward to – we'll see you in Vegas, man. Take care.